The Titanic carried 3,300 passengers and crew. Nearly half of them lost their lives on the night of April 14, 1912. But the stories of the Titanic live on. On the ship were millionaires, artists, fashionistas, bakers, cookers, musicians, doctors, and con men. These are their stories. Welcome to the Last Night on the Titanic podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our Last Night on the Titanic series, where we're looking at the very different and diverse set of lives that were on the Titanic the night it went down and really made the Titanic so memorable. It wasn't just the aristocrats. It wasn't just third class, but many people from many different backgrounds have many different stories to tell. We're trying to do our best to get into some of those stories. So that's what this podcast is all about. Joined, as always, with Veronica Hinkey, the expert on the topic. Veronica, how are you? I'm well, Scott. I've been looking forward to talking with you about the cooks and the ice cream makers. Yeah, I'm very interested in this because I enjoyed our episode talking about the baker. You get people from very colorful backgrounds, and I imagine cooks will be exactly the same. But yeah, let's just jump right into it and talk about our first cook and his story. And I don't think we're going to be disappointed. So he is Paul Moguet. So tell us about Paul. Well, Paul was one of many cooks, and he reported to Pierre Rousseau. And Pierre Rousseau was the chef of the Titanic's a la carte restaurant. Now, to understand what they did there, I have to tell you a little bit about the restaurant. It was the first of its kind in sea travel at the time. It was a restaurant where people could go and they could order things off the menu at any time. They could pick and choose things a la carte that they wanted to enjoy. They were not you know, held by a specific menu and only those things they could, it was much more broader menu than they would be able to um, experience in the, the large dining room, the first class dining room. And what was really interesting is that, um, and this came into, this came to be a concern in the line of succession when filling lifeboats, the white star line did not operate the a la carte restaurant. The a la carte restaurant was operated as a concession by Luigi Gatti, who was an Italian entrepreneur. And uh, Rousseau and others, he had, you know, through his connections in the restaurant world, he had uh, networked and brought together this um, dream crew for his, his restaurant. However, because they were a concession, we'll get into that in a few minutes about what uh, happened to them, uh, their story was very tragic. Ultimately, just like we learned about the Baker's experiences that night, Paul Moguet told his story to the British inquiry officials. And the next day, the headline ran in the wire services. The headline was, Titanic Cooks Drowned Like Rats. Um, He explained to the British inquiry officials how um, 60 kitchen employees aboard the Titanic drowned like rats, they wrote in the story, in a trap when the liner went down because stewards blocked their way when they attempted to go to the decks. And that is because when they, Paul and others, encountered the stewards on their way to the boat deck to try to save their own lives, they were stopped and they were told, go back. Uh, You do not have a, a crew assignment. You're not a passenger. And so that is what happened to their fate that tragic night. Many of them did not survive. Paul Moguet did. So what did he do to survive when they were in this weird limbo where they weren't one category or another, so they really didn't have a place in the pecking order to escape the ship? So Paul was a man of persistence. He was born to unmarried parents in Paris in 1887 and had really, you know, scrounged up through his life to support himself. And that served him well on that last night aboard the Titanic. He fought like the Dickens to try to get into a lifeboat. And eventually he succeeded. Unfortunately, his urging to Pierre Rousseau, who was a very heavy set man and was concerned about jumping into a lifeboat, uh, he resisted and he did not jump into the lifeboat. Uh, Paul did. They were able to finally convince some stewards to let them through. And uh, the impression that I had from reading the inquiry notes is that 
it was indeed incredible resistance to to them being told go back, go back, and they just kept explaining. You know, we're part of of the a la carte crew. We're we're with um, Luigi Gatti's staff, and so they were able to slither through. So Paul jumps first into a lifeboat. It's the same lifeboat that Lawrence Beasley is in, and we talked about him the other day. Um, and he hollers up to uh, Chef Rousseau, saute, saute, which means jump, jump. And um, poor Rousseau hollers back, you know, I can't, I'm too large. I'm not going to be able to do this. And he does not. So sadly, he those two, you know, part their ways. Rousseau um, is one of the people that were referred to in the story in London the day after that British inquiry. He is first aware that the ship is sinking. Does he know that there's problems early on or does he hear warnings, but then he ignores it and goes about his business like a lot of other people do? What was that like for him? So Paul did you know, feel something like so many people did right away. He was sleeping. It woke him up. He got up. A steward first told him there was no danger. He said, it's better for you to just go to sleep. Um, then he heard it sounded like a bell ringing. He got up and he, he went and saw that people were running around with their luggage. He knew something was up. Then he saw Captain Smith go into the engine room. And then he returned two minutes later. Uh, Paul then found a private staircase that was just for crew. And he took that to get up to the first class boat deck. There again, for the second time that night, he sees Captain Smith. This time he says that Smith is prodding a woman to board a lifeboat. Many of the women were very fearful. Uh, Just getting into a lifeboat, you sometimes had to jump several stories down to get into one. Many times they were slanted. um, They were crowded sometimes with many people in them, which I I'm supposing was the case with with when Chef Rousseau looked at the lifeboat and pondered getting in. It was, you know, it was probably full of people and he knew that if he jumped on top of them, he might even kill someone. So um, there were those fears and they really believed, many of them believed that they were safer on the planet than in the lifeboats. So the captains told, told one woman, Paul overheard him saying to her, it is all right, lady. You should get into the lifeboat. Once he actually was able to get into one, was it, <laughs> I wish I could think of a better phrase than smooth sailing coming to mind, but was he able to more or less uh, escape the sinking once he was able to get into a lifeboat? Right. Paul was one of those picked up in the same lifeboat as Lawrence Beasley and others, and he was picked up by the Carpathia. Well, another person, too, who kind of has a parallel story among uh, all these uh, different people with the cooks is an ice cream maker. The particular person we're looking at is Adolf Matman. First of all, what was an ice cream maker doing? Was he similar to the popcorn man that we looked at in an earlier episode? Sort of where is he in the hierarchy of the Titanic? And what is Adolf Matman's story specifically? Adolf Matman was the ice cream maker aboard the Titanic. Um, To compare him to Popcorn Dan, who we talked about in another episode, um, Popcorn Dan sold popcorn at home in Merrill, Wisconsin, whereas Adolf was really hired just to be part of the crew to make the ice cream. He was a young man. He was, I, I believe he was 20 years old, 19, 20 years old, and just getting a, a grip on his adult life. Um, his dream was to work as a patissier in one of the finest restaurants in London. And he wrote home to his parents and told them, if I can just get two crossings on the Titanic, I will be able to go into any hotel in London and land a really good job as a patissier. So that was his goal. Um, he made ice cream. They, they also had electric sorbet makers on board the Titanic, interestingly enough. Um, and one of the menus uh, shows French vanilla ice cream and another one shows American ice cream. So that, you know, begs the question, well, what's the difference? So French vanilla ice cream, if you've ever had it, you notice it's got a little bit of a yellow he, a hint to it, a little tinge of yellow. And that is because the difference between French and American vanilla ice cream is the eggs. French vanilla ice cream um, has egg yolks 
So it has a little bit more of a custard like consistency. Um, and at the end of the episode, we have a, a special treat. The culinary spotlight is a recipe for French vanilla ice cream that we'll tell you about a little later. What does American use if it doesn't use eggs? Uh, it uses cream and milk. I'm curious because I'm from a uh, farm lineage in Iowa and the thing there was always the hand cranked ice cream. So something my father still makes on a pretty regular basis from basically late March into October. So ice cream season runs along for him when he makes it, but still uses the hand crank machine, insists that it's better than the electric one. Don't know why, but you know, he's the expert. So I'll just defer to his judgment on that one. So it sounds like the French one is more like it, but I guess we'll find out more when we get into the recipe. My own dad made ice cream with a hand cranked ice cream maker years ago. So it's really great that you share that. It's really interesting because uh, I was really pleased to be able to include this little part about Adolf and, and how he made the ice cream because of, I remember us as kids, you know, circled around that ice cream maker and we used to pack it with salt. She used to pack salt around the edges of the ice cream maker. Is that way before your time? Well, that's how he did it. And I, for carrying on the legacy, I thought of getting one similar to that. And I wonder what would have been like on the Titanic for uh, Adolf Mattman that would he have had some sort of electrical device? Is it something that's brought on if he's making it scale? Man, that's just misery to crank it all the time because it takes about 30 or 40 minutes of cranking to make a gallon or so, which the experience is fun. But if you have hundreds of people in first class, then that's a lot of work. So do you have any sense of what his equipment would have been like? The sense that I have, because we know electric sorbet makers, I did find that piece of information in my research. So the sense that I have, and like you say, for so many people, probably would have been electric. Really living the classy lifestyle. If you had to crank all that, ugh, it'd be like being at a slave galley or being on a trireme and having to constantly pull oars. At least it was better for him there. I was just going to say that Adolf is one of uh, Luigi Gatti concession, Luigi Gatti's concession staff. Um, he too, I just wanted to make the note that he too was one of the staff from the a la carte restaurant that did not make it out and was part of that count in the news story that ran the day after the British inquiry about how the uh, cooks drowned like rats. I'm sure he was included in that. Uh, description and only he was even though he's making the ice cream I think they were including all the staff in the a la carte restaurant that did not make it out before we get to what you do know about what happened when the ship went down are there other bits of his background you think are relevant to the story at hand since like a lot of these other figures he traveled a lot over the course of his life and pretty far from where he was born. What's his background? He was one of the few Swiss people on board that I came across. He actually was on uh, one of his first crossings. That winter, he had worked, as did many of the crew, aboard the Olympic, which was the sister ship of the Titanic. The Olympic was built very much along the same lines as the Titanic, and the idea was that the Titanic would come after all the kinks were out of the Olympic because the Titanic would be perfection. So um, he had sort of worked his way over to the Titanic, like many of the folks did, many of the crew did from the Olympic. It was almost identical from Olympic crew to Titanic. And I think there was a great enthusiasm for people to be on that ship, especially for that maiden crossing. It was huge for someone's career like Adolf. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. He had apprenticed as a pastry chef in Freiburg, Switzerland. He had worked for a time at the storied Carl Haberl pastry shop in Lucerne. And uh, his parents owned a wine shop, the Matman Wine Shop. And it was located on the banks of the village stream at what is now today it's Hopstrasse 27. Um, and he was born there in 1891, right in, in the wine shop. He went to primary school in Inwill, Switzerland, and went to on to a monastic school. And when he was there, he journaled a lot. And one of the um, quotes that he kept on his journal was, all the days of your life have God in the heart. And for me, that was one of the pull quotes from my research that I 
held dear to me. I just love that, that I, a young man who was so determined to make a good life for himself uh, was conscientious and thought of those types of quotes that would help keep him inspired. I don't know if there's much information about what happens to him on the night that the ship sunk, but because he is from Switzerland and because his family is all there, the way that they hear about the news is much different from those who had family in England or in the United States. It's something I didn't really think about, but the ripple effects of how something like this, even it's the biggest news story in the world, still takes days and days and days even just to get across Europe. Do you know anything about what his experience was like when the ship went down? And then how did the news reach his family? From the time we know about the letters where he had written to his family about wanting to get a couple crossings under his belt and he would be able to apply and get a job at any of the finest restaurants in London, up until after the sinking, we really don't have information on what happened to Adolf that night. Um, We do know a little bit about what probably happened to him based on Paul Moguet's uh, testimony to the British inquiry officials. And um, there was a story that ran in the paper in his um, hometown and home area in Switzerland on April 17th. Uh, The Lucerne Tagblatt wrote, ran a story and there were many contradictory stories around that everyone was waiting with hope that their hometown hero was safe Um, but near the end of the month the white star line notified the matmans that adolf had been on board the titanic and he had not been rescued Uh, on april 30th the village of inwell his um, hometown had a funeral service for adolf adolf was beloved he was a hometown hero in Inwell, this town in Switzerland where his family had a wine shop. He was well known because he had really been dedicated to his dream of working in pastry and ice cream and uh, working as a, a pastry chef. He had worked at the Hotel Lowen in Wegis and Lucerne for two summers. Now he was moving along, you know, in his dreams of pursuing a pastry chef career, like so many people do today. Well, we definitely have something to uh, go on with our culinary spotlight that you teased earlier with the French vanilla ice cream, because what we do at the end of each episode with our drinking, dining, and style guide is do something to recreate what the experience of the Titanic was and Because so many people who were there were in service in one way or another, and everybody consumed in one way or another, getting a sense of those consumables and everything else and potent potables, I think really gives us a snapshot of what that was like. Tell us about the French vanilla ice cream recipe. Well, it was an obvious choice for this episode because as Adolf being the ice cream maker aboard the Titanic, of course, we had to have a recipe that focused on ice cream. And we definitely wanted to have a recipe in this book for French vanilla ice cream. I mentioned earlier that the difference between French vanilla and American vanilla is that French vanilla is made with the egg yolks. That's why it looks a little bit yellow or yellower compared to uh, American ice cream, which is made with uh, milk and cream. And this recipe is is really special. It's made by a chef that I've worked with over the years in Evanston, Illinois at Hearth Restaurant. His name is Michael Elliott. And Michael is an executive chef there and he contributed this recipe for French vanilla ice cream. It's four cups of milk, a cup and a half of cream, two and a half cups of sugar, one cup dry milk powder, and then 10 egg yolks. So it's pretty substantial there with the egg yolks. It'll give it a nice yellow color, yellowish. Um, And a tablespoon of salt, two vanilla pods with the seed scraped. And most of us know how to to follow that routine. And it's so delicious. Yeah, that really takes it up a notch. This isn't just the normal extract, especially the vanilla pods. Making it more artisanal, I think that's really going to take things up a step. And for people listening, if you didn't catch everything, there are recipes for all these things, not just this culinary spotlight, but all the ones that have appeared in each of the episodes in our show notes. 
Veronica, thanks for going over all of this. And in the next episode, we're going to look at the people who played a critical role. And I think if there's any type of idea of chivalry on the Titanic, it came with the helpers. So we're going to look at their lives and what happened when the ship was going down in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Last Night on the Titanic podcast. To listen to all the episodes in the series, go to lastnightonthetitanicpodcast.com. There you also find show notes, biographical profiles of the passengers and crew on the Titanic, and recipes for all the recipe spotlights that we do in the series. One last thing, if you like the show, please rate and review it on the podcast listener of your choice. Thanks again for listening, and see you next time.